I also meant to see if this thing works. Cool. So I am JC. I own my own company. That's not that important right now. It's got a lot of uh, teachable moments for me in business and experience, but I've got a pretty interesting past. I'm a USMC veteran. I know VetSec sponsors. Big, where's my veterans? Where's my Marine Corps veterans? Hoorah! <laughs> That's about 15 years out of service right there. Yep. I, I, can, I can gauge that response. 30 minutes, it would have been loud and proud, but it's got some miles on us. I was an information uh, system security officer for a defense industry-based uh, company, a defense contractor. That's pretty much a government-mandated position. A uh, lot of learning experiences there. Been a cybersecurity consultant. That's kind of my, my bag now. I've learned so much value in the consulting world. Where are my consultants at? A lot of this might seem second nature. Uh, students. I've been a student. Oh, yeah. This is for you. This is for you. This is 20, 15, 20 years of my life experience condensed into like three teachable moments. Been a trainer. If you're going to Black Hat, we're teaching a course. I'm teaching one. My wife Snow's teaching one. Check us out. I also formerly ran the vault at SynCon. Gave that thing up. It had like five years in it. We've, we've passed the torch, and we're going to try and bring, hopefully, something new to St. Con. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Co-founder of Social Engineering Community, who's been to DEF CON? Keep your hand up if you've been to the Social Engineering Village. Yeah! My Social Engineering Village? Yeah! That's awesome. I love it. If you haven't been and plan on going to DEF CON, come see us. This is an amazing event. I guarantee you'll love it. Uh, and... To humanize myself, I'm currently learning to scuba dive. That's slightly terrifying. So the first question is, how did I get here? Well, with a little bit of Pope magic. If you don't know who Pope is, he is a legend in and of himself in his own right, in his own way. If you haven't met Pope, you're not going to meet him today because apparently he's in Singapore. For that reason, if you have Twitter, because that's all I know he's on, Please tweet him. Tweet him if you like this presentation, or tweet him if you hate it and you think it's stupid, or if you don't have an opinion, just tweet him all the same. Pope is one of those people that's very well connected. He knows all sorts of people, and he invites them for different presentations, invites them for keynotes. This happens to be one of those situations where I am, I forget what I was doing. I was minding my own business, and I get a phone call, and Pope's like, hey, what do you think about keynoting for B-sides? I was like, all right, so you've officially ran out of people, so here I am. I said yes, and, and here I am. I had one question for Pope. I said, that's cool, but what's the theme? Because I'm very big into the theme, right? A keynote is not a technical talk. A keynote is to be inspiring. It's to set the stage. It's to you know, really build on the theme. And he's like, theme this is B-sides. The theme is show up. All right, well, we're, we're going to fix that. I guarantee by the end, B-Sides 2024 will have a theme. You're welcome, Bryce. Thank you. <laughs> so my first story starts in the Marine Corps. Steel sharpened steel. Back in 2005, I joined the Marine Corps. I don't know what the hell I was thinking, but it seemed like a good idea at the time. That decision got challenged back and forth for that four-year enlistment. I stand by that it was the best decision I've ever made in my life. I'd do it again in a heartbeat. Probably do a few things differently, but for the most part, I'd do it all the same. In 2006, after boot camp, after Marine combat training, you go to your, your school. What it is you're actually going to do for me, I was going to be a field radio operator. How did I find that out? Well, they don't tell you till like the last minute. And I'm going in and like, hey, you're going to be a field radio operator. And I said, what the hell is that? And I, I kid you not, the guy looks at me, he's like, you know those war movies? I was like, yeah. He's like, you know the guy running around with the antenna to get shot first? That's you. I was like, shit, all right, yeah. <laughs> questioning, the, yeah. questioning decision number one. So off to comm school I went. In comm school, or formerly called field radio operator course, you're taught 
all sorts of things. Everything from radio etiquette. I got so lucky. I was like a, a year late, a, a year after they phased out Morse code, or else I'd have to learn Morse code. We learn radios, we learn signal propagation, we learn antenna design. I can make an antenna out of the ground wiring in a building if I had to. You learn all sorts of weird stuff. But we learn about this antenna called the OE254. This is the workhorse of radio in the Marine Corps. It may have changed, this is a little dated, but I, I bet this thing is still around. The OE254 is an omnidirectional antenna. This thing can stand up to 33 feet tall. Yeah, if you look at that picture, where's my picture? Look how tall that antenna is, it's, it's unwieldy. What you don't see is uh, two sets of guidelines, one near the top, four guidelines per set, and another one in the mid to try and wrangle this thing. It is this nasty, wobbly beast. Withstands up to, I think, 90 miles an hour. You got some ranges, it's beautiful, all of drab. Uh, it comes in a million pieces. If you look at the pieces of this thing, it is nasty to work with. It comes in this unconventional tote bag thing that leaks parts, comes with its own mallet. You'll see all these, all these little pieces. You'll see these uh, little rings right here. You'll see a little stake right here. You'll see some bigger stakes. It's this whole affair to set up. They recommend that two individuals, two Marines, can set this up in 15 minutes. Yeah, that's, you know, when you, when you think, I see a couple of nods like, yeah, that's, that's, that's fast. I don't know if I could do that. That is fast if you do it this way. Once I left comm school, graduated second in my class, which let me pick wherever I want to go, so I chose sunny California. I got to the fleet, and there I figured out what we do if we're not deployed. We train. We train hard. And we clean. That's it. We train, we clean. If you ever wonder what somebody does in the military, I can speak for the Marine Corps. You train, you clean. That's it. Sometimes you don't train so well, and you clean harder. You ever mop in a rainstorm in the parking lot? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a very endearing community. We train for about six months before we deploy. The reason is because you want that practice. You want that muscle memory. You want that repetition, right? So here I am, new to the fleet, and I start hearing this phrase, steel sharpened steel, right? Really, it's this program of mentorship in the military to keep young Marines, who are super cocky, have technically disposable income because everything that's important is paid for because Uncle Sam doesn't trust an 18-year-old kid. And it's really to keep you from getting married, right, and making bad, hasty decisions. Joke's on them. I got married between uh, comm school and MCT to my beautiful wife, Stephanie. Buying a vehicle, tons of predatory loans. I think there's a... Uh, I think the standard APR for a car right outside the base is like 35%, 40%, which if you're an uneducated young adult man, you will sign that because that Mustang looks cool. Uh, getting out of debt because you purchased a 1999 Mustang at 40% APR, you have some debt. Deployment readiness, making sure your family's good to go. There's a lot, of, a lot of core reasons why they came up with this program. But it didn't stop us from really utilizing this name, the, the, the really cool name that it was, to train each other, to make sure your standards are at my level. So even though it had this, this formal point, this formal type of mentoring ship, we abused it so that we held you to our standards. If I can do something better, faster, stronger than you, there's no reason you can't. And so, okay, I'm learning. My first run-in with that is the OE-254. I thought I was hot stuff. Just left comm school. I know everything, second in my class. We're going out to the field to test and, and test the new guys. And I'm looking around. I was like, where's, where's the bags? Where's all the bags? Where's all the parts? Where, where, where's half the antenna? And they're like, what are you talking about? So in order to set up an OE-254 in our artillery battery, there's a couple step process that you do after you get your antenna. The first thing is you strip out the important bits. That's the feed cone, that thing in the first picture on the right hand side, and then there's elements. That's all the little metal bits. There's three metal bits, 
to one antenna element. So you have to screw those together. That takes time. And then you have to screw that into the feed cone. There's six of those that go into the feed cone. That takes time. And then you stick an insulating pole, which is about like a two-foot stick, into that feed cone. And that is the core antenna. Everything else is in support of getting it up in the air, which we came up with, a, or I should say they came up with a much better way. Next, you'll see camming net poles. If you ever see a classic picture of the military deployed, you'll see tanks, you'll see artillery, you'll see whatever, but they're under these big camouflage nets. We call those cami nets. And those get essentially laid out and then staked down and hoisted up with these poles. These poles come in four foot sections. Our trailer in the military was like 10 feet. So theoretically, I can take two of these bad boys together, duct tape it, and I've got an eight foot mass section. Something really interesting happens. I wanna think that's like military, contracting, forward thinking. The diameter of the inside of these pipes perfectly fits the insulating tube of this antenna. So of course, Marines, right? If it fits, it ships. It's that easy, right? If it's not supposed to go together, it shouldn't fit together. We don't have time to think. So these Marines take two of these sections together so they're ready. And these are rigid aluminum. They're not flexible. They're thick. They're heavy. And they've got essentially all of this stuff prepped. The, and, uh, the elements are already screwed together. They just need to be adapted to the feed cone. And the last thing we do is we steal engineering sticks from the Army. I didn't press anything. Oh, OK. Just won't walk over here anymore. Test. We steal some engineering stakes from the Army. If you haven't seen them, these are things that hold Constantina wire, the big circle barbed wire. There's little notches on them. Steel, if you aren't familiar, is the strategic transfer of equipment to an alternate location. Don't think we just rob people. We're, we're just moving it. So we steal some Army, uh, some Army engineering stakes. And now what we do is we have, uh, essentially, in our, in our team, we had four, four Marines that were dedicated to antenna building. And they would run around with these big hammers, these big tube hammers that drive the stakes in. And they, we had six antennas to set up. And they would drive these stakes into the ground. With two Marines, they just slam this thing down, and they'll get a stake in in about 30 seconds. It's pretty fast. We jam about four or five of these eight-foot sections, however high we want, together. And then we slap the insulating tube that you attach to that uh, feed cone. Somebody's screwing in the elements. And then you raise it like a big flagpole up against the engineering stake. And here's where the ingenious part comes from. And this is why you won't ever see OSHA in, in the field or really on a deployment. We duct tape the crap out of that thing to the engineering stake. And what takes us about four, uh, 15 minutes out of the bag doing it the right way takes us, when I, when I got to this unit, probably three minutes or so to do one antenna. Really fast. So let's break down the numbers. With our team, uh, where you, you have four Marines tasked to raise antenna, six antennas, 15 minutes an antenna, two Marines per antenna. You do it by the book. It takes approximately 45 minutes to get these things up. Our way, which is not the official way, but we could get away with it because unlike infantry, we always had trucks because we were artillery. We could haul more stuff. We could take these cami net poles. We could pre-assemble, pre-stage things. We were able to get them up in about eight minutes, six antennas. That's huge, all because we came up with a better idea. Now, who cares, right? You got to the fleet. You got to your artillery unit. No, oh, don't step over there. Somebody already figured this out. What's the point? Well, I didn't stay there forever. Something really interesting happened in 2007. For some reason, I don't really understand the, the need for it or the history of it or whatever, the Marine Corps decided to stand up an individual battery, which is very rare. This battery was essentially deactivated, and they, in 2007, reactivated it. 312 doesn't exist, but they stood up the 312 India battery, and they assigned it to, uh, I think, 110. None of that matters. It's all just hierarchy stuff. But this is a brand new battery. 
meaning there is no old dogs anymore. There is nobody waiting to receive you and yell at you and haze you and harass I mean, motivate you, teach you, support you, steal, sharpen, steal. There's nobody there. So me, a handful of uh, my other comm Marines from our artillery unit, get sent over to help stand up this unit in preparation for deployment on the 15th MU later in 2008. This is where it gets interesting. They send other radio operators, other wiremen, other Marines from other units, and people new from comm school. So we had a mix. We had people from comm only units. We had people from infantry. We had people from, uh, pretty much we were the only ones from artillery. So we're the only ones that have ever done comm for artillery going to another artillery battery. When we get there, I don't want to say it was new, it was new to us. There's all of our gear in the bags, just like in comm school. So there's the young Marines that are just out of comm school. There's the ones from uh, uh, the regular comm shops from infantry. They're like, oh, cool, I know this. Right, we'll get this up, Gunny, in you know, 30, 40 minutes tops. And we're like, what the hell are you talking about? 10 minutes and you're slow. And they're looking at us like we're crazy. They're like, no, no, watch this. Hey, you go get the caminet poles. Hey, I need two rolls of duct tape. Watch this. And me and two other guys showed them our way from another artillery battery. This became SOP. And it's only because it was taught for me. Now, where, uh, taught to me from that previous battery. So we're over there educating them. And here you can kind of see that insulating tube. That's, that's what will actually go inside the cami, uh, the cami net pole and it goes up. We changed what was going to be presumed to be the, the SOP for this artillery battery. That would have been doing it the hard way, uh, in my opinion, the wrong way, but more importantly, the slow way. And that's going to become important when I get into the next lesson. This was awesome. This made us look like geniuses. And the thing that really pisses me off back in these days, I didn't, like, smartphones were barely a thing. Like, you flip phone, the Moto Razor was like the, the tech, right? So cell phone videos, for better or for worse, didn't really exist. I only have one picture of these things. And again, there's no guidelines, right? There's nothing to really, like, tune and keep it straight. But I do have one picture of me and a guy from one of the comm shops. And you can see our little haphazards. You see three of the six. And there they are, just taped to an engineering sake, just hanging out. And you can see some of them got a little bit of a gangster lean, but there they are. And that is probably the, the most proud we were out of that, uh, out of that first field op where we're, we're essentially showing, hey, look how smart we are. And now our efficiency went up so much more than what was originally thought possible. The question is, is what do you know how many people have been to more than two jobs? Good, we're experiencing life. How many of you brought something from the old job to the new job? How many did that purposely and willingly? How many realized maybe they should like say, hey, here's a new way? Yeah, that's fine, that's, that's okay, right? Because sometimes you don't realize, hey, I have value, I have a different way of doing it. Where are my three consultants at? There's not a lot of them. There's something really interesting you'll see in the consulting world. Because you pollinate like a bee, you go from company to company to company. There's something I notice that's very interesting. It's a little disparaging, I'm sorry. But we'll find, we'll run into people that have been 10, 20 years into an organization, and they are indoctrinated. When you're 20 years into an organization, there is the way, and that is the only way. And these people are very, very, usually very hard to move over to a new way of thinking. It's interesting. So having that, I don't want to call it fresh blood, but, but new talent come in, you'll get, you'll get new perspectives. So when you're interviewing, when you're hiring, when you're bringing in new talent, make sure not to rob them of that experience. Make sure to showcase it. Show what other alternatives you have because it's valuable, I promise you. Now, uh, Bryce, are you still here? I didn't think so, all right. I'm pretty sure he used ChatGPT to make his images. So did I. It's pretty cool. I got a question for the audience. This is where we're going to get into some participation pieces. Who here knows what Disney and the Marine Corps has in common? Let's get them. You got one right here. You got another one right here. Man. We're, Military? 
Which one? Uh, st stick around, man. Stick around. <laughs> uh, we might both like crayons. If you're looking to bribe, my favorite flavor is blue. <laughs> but anybody else? What about the mission? Yeah, now it's obvious, right? Oh, yeah, Marine Corps has got a mission. Military has got a mission. Air Force has a mission. Might be to sleep until 9, but we got a mission. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll fight. We'll, we'll play. We got a mission. This is the really interesting thing. The Marine Corps, more specifically artillery, because that's what I cared about, has a mission. This is right out of the technical manual. You can see there at the bottom. You can Google it. You can Google our whole, or you can actually pull the PDF of artillery operations. You want to learn artillery operations top to bottom? We publish it. Knock yourself out. Page one, paragraph one, sentence one, it starts with the mission. Uh, if you read this, right, it's, it's, it's kind of lengthy. The mission of artillery is furnished close and continuous fire support by neutralizing, destroying, or suppressing targets that threaten the success of the support unit. Kind of open-ended. To accomplish this mission, artillery has the following responsibilities, blah, 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 blah. Marines are not smart. We're not. We're not. We have too much to do to be smart. We've got to be fast. We've got to be efficient. For that reason, we typically don't memorize all this. We memorized the first bullet. Why? Because it was the shortest, and it made us look smart. Right? I could recite the mission, right? and you Google it. Oh, shit, that is the mission. He does know the mission. Provide timely, close, accurate, continuous fire support. That was it. When you're in the Marine Artillery Unit, every action you do better be in support of this. Anything else, and you're wrong. You're doing it wrong. So when we showed up day one, and we're cutting your time down from 45 minutes to eight minutes, we are supporting the mission. We are becoming more mission ready, more mission effective. Because the key there is timely. That means when we roll into a position, it's, it is a circus. There's people raising guns. There's people aiming the guns. It's a whole charade. There's all these math calculations and fire direction control. We're a small piece. Yeah, we're the people that get shot first. In fact, they put us over on something called Antenna Hill because when the enemy sees the antennas, that's what they shoot first. So they push us over like lepers, and then we deal with that. But our goal is to get communication up. You get communication up fast, you're getting fire missions fast. Provide Timely, close, accurate, continuous fire support. Anything you do better be in support of that. It's that easy. Disney also has a mission. I love this picture. Have you ever rode Tower of Terror by your, uh, with, with one friend in a tuxedo? This is what consulting's all about. This was at BAE Systems as part of their sales thing, right? They rented out like Disney World. So it's ridiculous. Disney has a mission. Think about this for a second. The mission of the Walt Disney Company is to entertain, inform, and inspire people around the globe through the power of unparalleled storytelling. That's it. Everything you do at Disney better align to this in some way, shape, or form. Anything else you're detracting from the mission. You're doing accounts? Better support this. Disney goes a step further, and this is a really interesting thing to think about. Disney goes a step further, and they have something called the brand promise. And you already know about the brand promise because it's kind of ingrained with big, high-profile brands. Think Apple. right? When you think Apple, Apple, Steve Jobs has never come out and guaranteed you something. He's never promised anything. But through their action, through what they've given, you come to expect expensive. You come to expense a beautiful UI. Same thing happens with Disney. You hear it referred to as the happiest place on earth. When you come to Disney, when you see a Disney movie, when you see Disney anything, you have an expectation. That's Disney making good on their brand promise. They go through and they write their brand promise and that's what they teach their employees. Disney does something really interesting and I got to learn this. Disney has a whole institute where you can learn from them their business things. I've, I've been able to take some of their training one of the things they talk about is being off mission but on brand. Sometimes you have to deviate from the mission in order to maintain the brand. You, I guarantee if you have any social media, if you watch Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever, you've seen this. 
This is a classic Disney park situation where the little kid will lose the balloon. The balloon costs like $15. Parents are pissed, kids pissed, the squirrels next to them, everybody's pissed, right? And you will have the employee come over and hand another balloon. What does that do? It keeps everybody happy. You'll have stories where a, a, kid, a kid soils himself, right? You will have a cast member escort him over, pull off clothes from the rack, and just give it to him. Why? Because it builds on that promise that you will always be happy here. And guess what happens to that family gets that, that gets taken care of like that? What do they do? It's interactive. They come, back again. they come back again, which is the purpose of the company, to be profitable. So I'm going to ask you, what's your mission? Think about that for just a second. Who's not employed? You still got a mission. Now, I like my inverse questions. Because it tells me the one person that's really unfair to pick on. Everybody else says they're employed. Everybody else is a target. No, no, no. No, no, no. What's the mission at your company? What is this? Is it boss back there? No, no, no. That's all right. That's all right. Mission at your company? That's all right. Anybody? Mission at their company? Look around right now. No, no, keep your hands up. Keep, please, please, please. I'm not going to call on you, but look around. No, don't, don't. No, no, stop it. You're late to the party. Not, I will call on you now. Don't try and get credit, right? There's not that many hands, and I'm not calling you out so much as maybe I'm calling out your employer. Maybe I am calling you out. What is it that you are doing to support that company's mission? We're a little disconnected there. That's one of the biggest stories, or one of the biggest lessons I can give you to value, right? What you're doing has to support that company mission. Bryce kind of kicked it off with, hey, this is all about moving up, right? You want to move up in your career. What better way to provide better value for the company than being in alignment with their mission? The next story I have is a great story. It's one of my favorite stories. It's Snow's favorite story. It's the pencil story. The pencil story, I move out of the, the Marine Corps. Now I'm in the, uh, the DOD contracting world. Um, at this point, I'm doing something that I think is providing value. I'm doing an action, and this is where I get my first mentor. This is a, a groundbreaking experience because I get pulled aside. And I get told, hey, let me, let me teach you a little something, young JC. We're going to get on the soapbox real quick. Who here is a mentor? Those of you that put your hand up, what do you get back from your mentor mentees? That's, that's my point right there. I'm not going to call you out, sir, but raise your hand like, like, like I, I don't know. In my opinion, this is my opinion. This is my soapbox rant. That's not a mentorship. That's you teaching. A mentorship is a two-way street. There has to be something in it for you to care enough. There has to be some type of reciprocity, something that gives back. Or else you're just you're, you're, you're conducting a coaching session, right? A mentorship, you really have to get into their head, know where they are. Would that be fair? Think about that. I see a lot of people like, oh, I'll be your mentor. Why? Why? What am I to you? It's a two-way street. I don't have time for this, but this, this, is, this is one of my big hot buttons. Everybody wants to be a mentor. Let it happen. Let it be informal. Let it be organic. Let somebody that knows a little bit more about you help you out, and then you return the favor. Right? Work together. Collaborate. This one essentially pissed him off. So he called me up. Young JC, I got a story to tell you, and that is the story of the pencil. He said, young JC, imagine, if you will, a table and everyone around the table. And that table is slightly crooked to the point where if you put a pencil down, it will roll off the table. Young JC, and he was very adamant about the young JC part, what you are doing is you are reaching out and you are grabbing that pencil right before it falls and you're putting it right back. I was like, what are you talking about? 
He's like, what you're doing is you are stopping everyone from seeing a bigger problem. You're fixing the symptom, you're not addressing the problem, and the problem isn't yours to address. This doesn't make any sense until you see it. And the first time I saw it was at a company where I was friends with the IT help desk manager, me and him, best friends. I did a lot of work with their IT team. And so every once in a while I'd have to work late, and I would routinely go over there, maybe asking for something stupid, a cable, a drive, whatever. I needed something. There was usually one person working. Something happened recently at this company where three of their IT help desk out of their like eight or nine left. They all, they're all friends, they all talk, they all got some startup job doing IT. Great for them, right? Took off 30% of their workforce. What these help desk individuals did was what? You just had three people leave your team. What do you do? You're working three jobs now. These are hourly employees before California did their weird employment law where everybody's salary. They're hourly employees. You have to request overtime. They're not doing it. They don't want to get inundated with all the requests. So they've all decided, you know, we'll stay 30 minutes an hour extra overtime to play catch up while they, while they hire, right? So I'm sitting there. I come in again to, to get some more gear one night. And there's like six of them there. I was like, the hell are all of you guys doing here? What's going on? Something big? It's like, no, the, the three dudes left, so we're just catching up on tickets. And, and they're having a great time, right? I think I saw a beer, right? They're just cruising through, just knocking them out. I was like, huh, that's interesting. Next day, I go over, and, and they're doing this for like maybe a week, maybe two weeks. I go over to the IT manager again. I was like, hey, man, you know, like all your dudes are staying late, right? Knocking out tickets. He's like, what the hell are you talking about? This is one of the, this is a California company, right? So we're on board shorts at 4 p.m. and off to the waves if you didn't do it in the morning. And he's like, what are you talking about? I was like, yeah, check this out, stick around. And sure enough, nobody left at five o'clock. They all stuck around. And he got up, he's like, what are y'all doing? So, oh, we're catching up on tickets. They weren't planning on backfilling those positions, why? The work was being done. They were picking up the pencil. You have to be very careful as you give the lesson, as you look at what you're doing is valuable. Are you actually doing what you should in support of the mission where you're expected to support? Or are you doing the wrong thing and taking the wrong eyes off of a problem? This was a crazy story to learn. And I, I, I think I use this story about like once a week when I talk to people. This is one of my favorite stories. Because it's one of those things that doesn't quite make sense until it happens to you, until you see it. I guarantee, how many here see the pencil at their workplace? Uh, yep. How many of you, just out of curiosity out of those hands, didn't realize that that was a pencil falling and you were not showcasing where the actual problem was? Maybe you're addressing it. Honestly, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's such a hard part, right? Because now you're conflicted, right? The dichotomy of, you know, do I do my job? Do I go the extra mile? Or is this sabotage? Now that's where that open communication is going to come in. That's where you have to have those value conversations. Hey, Make sure you know this. I'll do this once. I'll do this twice. We need to raise this. Don't just do it out of the goodness of your heart silently. So I've said it a couple times. What the hell's value? Anybody? It's a great way, value with cost. You're able to do that now because of, of capitalism. Back in the day, in the feudal markets, you would have to trade chickens for potatoes and then value was a huge mess. Now with cost, right, everything kind of has a centralized value, right, money, right? So value can be cost. It can also be time because time is money. Oh, that's, that's a good one. The perceived value. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. That's a great point. I think, I think both of you are correct, right? It's, it's cost and it's perceived cost. It's, it's all relative. What's a CISSP cost? A lot of time, a lot of money. What's it worth? What's the value of it? Here's, here's the important question. You didn't think about this yet. And we had a conversation earlier. This, this uh, young individual is getting a CISSP tomorrow, I believe. 
<laughs> soon, soon. What's the value of it? Why? Why do it? I've been told that I need it. I didn't ask who told you. I asked what's the value of it. It was so that I know what I'm talking about and help me get jobs. Will it? Let's, let's ask the audience. This is, this is what I love about community. Raise your hand if it'll show you know what you're talking about and help you get jobs. I see a lot of this. <laughs> Did anybody, when they told you that, say, it'll get you some jobs? Get you past HR. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> After that, you might be on your own. Yeah. What if you could, who's a real CISSP nut, like a guru? Like, who believes in it? And that's fine. I am. I am. It's a huge, it's a huge certification. It's hard, right? There's not a lot of people who have it. What happens if you can sit there and explain what the value of the CISSP is to the organization? What if you can say, hey, I can differentiate myself from other individuals, other candidates, because I have a CISSP. And you know what that means? It means I'm trained in these body of knowledge. I've been certified by a third party organization that I know about this. Let's talk about this. How are you all doing access control? When you terminate a user, what are we doing? And you start having a conversation based on those bodies of knowledge. That's where the value comes in. That's what we were just talking about, the perceived value, right? The gentleman right behind you. CISSP doesn't mean crap to you, but the stuff that you can translate and show value to the company, that means something to the hiring manager. That means something to who you'd report to, to be able to articulate in that direction. Fair points on, on value, is that fair? So we talked a little bit about cost. I talk on ROI. So you have ROI, your return on investment. When you do something, you have to have a return. I'll be honest, there's no such thing as selflessness. That's one of my soapboxes. Everyone does it for a selfish reason. Now, granted, some people get a joy of giving back. I am one of those sickos that love public speaking. I like getting up here, yelling, calling people out. I have fun with this. This is my entertainment. I love talking. I love training. Uh, that's what I'm getting out of this. When you ask, hey, what's that guy getting out of the deal? I'm enjoying this. I'm enjoying the connections. I'm enjoying maybe tossing my company logo up here. There's always, there's always, there's always a selfless or a selfishness piece to it. You, nobody ever just gives to give, right? At a, at a very minimum piece, you're giving to feel better. It makes you feel good. I've never met anybody that has a good answer to this of how selfless they are. There's always ROI. For the young student here that's gonna get the CISSP, the ROI on doing all that training, yeah, you're gonna be the focal point of this conversation. Doing that training, taking the time, spend that money, it's not a cheap certification. Student on a budget, that sucks. That's a, that's a commitment, right? The value, the return on investment is that you get past HR, somebody said back there. You might be able to talk competently, right? There's, there's a return, at least you hope there's a return, right? You just saw a lot of, uh, maybe not the right way. The understand is, the other thing, and this is, where's my students at? This is my huge one for students. When you sit across from a hiring manager, flip the script, everybody's always interested. Hey, I'm gonna go to this company, I'm gonna be a data analyst, a security analyst, I'm gonna get paid buku bucks, and this is gonna be awesome. No, what are you going to give my company? What do you bring to my table? What's your value proposition? It's perceived value, like the gentleman said here. What are you going to bring my company? How am I going to, I'm a, where are my nonprofits at? Not you, Bryce. Yeah, exactly. Most companies are for profit. You either have to grow my top line or you grow my bottom line. You either bring me business, you give me stuff to sell, welcome to consulting, or you reduce my expenses. You bring in some cool security stuff that, and I'm just gonna pick on you because I've terrorized this young man. <laughs> you bring me some stuff that's gonna reduce my insurance premium, right? What's the value proposition you bring? And a lot of people don't realize that when they go into their first job. What is it that I'm gonna give this company? When you start talking in that manner, when you start looking at it from their perspective and showing how you're going to make their life better, either the top line or bottom line, which that's all business cares about. That's how you stay in business. You're gonna be leaps and bounds beyond a CISSP. I double dog guarantee it all day. You talk business, you understand your value proposition, it's game over. And the last thing is commit to continue improvement. You're here, that's a commitment. You're here for ROI. This is your time. Who, did, who paid this out of pocket? I know it's, it's, it's a lot of money. 
That's, you want a return on this. This is your time. Time is money. You could be doing something else. We're not going to do economics. Time is money. The, there's a cost of uh, whatever the ticket is, anything else that you have to pay for. What are you getting out of this? Hopefully a lot from my presentation. Hopefully a lot more from the more technical presentations. How is that value going to sharpen your team, your friends, your individual projects, you yourself? Where does it all come together? Now, Bryce talked about this a little bit. He's like, hey, the future. The future's coming, right? We're going to have more jobs, more jobs, more jobs. I'm going to tell you a very silent story about the beauty of AI and automation. This has been going on for a decade. It's going to be a silent story. It's going to be a short story in six parts. Are jobs increasing for the fast food industry? Are they? What kind of jobs? There's transitions in place. And welcome to value. Is the value you bring going to be the value that you can bring 10 years from now? Is the value, where, where's another student? I've picked on these two students too much. Where's, where's my next student? What are you going to school for? To do what? Yeah, welcome to the hard question. Nobody, nobody prefaces you with that one, right? What are you going to do with that? Uh, electric, whatever they'll hire you for, right? How are you going to protect yourself from being replaced by AI? Documentation. Documentation, that's fair. One of the things that you'll notice, we, we saw this in New York, and, and they, they started doing articles on it, is uh, hostess at, at restaurants are being replaced by Zoom sessions where there's an offshore individual, essentially at a Zoom screen and a monitor that will handle your order, handle uh, hosting you. They're, they're essentially offshoring hostesses at certain restaurants, right? So don't be too confident that everything's guaranteed, right? Start future pacing. How is this gonna survive, right? When you think cybersecurity, cool, I'm gonna be an analyst. Yeah, what are you gonna analyze in 10 years? What are you going to analyze when all the algorithms are there and have fixed this? How are you going to differentiate yourself? How are you going to sharpen yourself? How are you going to bring more value? Which, welcome to the B-Side Salt Lake City 2024 theme, providing value. As you go out these doors and you go to your other sessions, I want you to ask yourself, the hell is he talking about? What about for? What point is she making that I'm going to use? How is this going to provide value to me? That's mean. Right? I'm not saying do it in a judgmental way. I'm saying do it in a way that challenges yourself. What are you doing with this information? Why are you there? How are you going to bring it back to your team? How are you going to sharpen them? How does what you're listening to, who's going to another session right after this? How's that session going to align to your company's mission, to your personal mission? That's what I want the theme to be. Figure out how this all works together, how this makes you better in your role, in your position, wherever you are in life, in, in the big picture. Now, my last story is going far, and this is going to be a pretty quick story. Snow and I, for some reason, decided to make a village at DEF CON. There was a need for one. We put in an application, and for some reason, they trusted us, and now we have the social engineering community at DEF CON. This thing is a behemoth. This is where one of the business lessons I learned from, a, from a, uh, another mentor in another business program told me this African proverb, and it stuck with me. If you want to go fast, go alone. Go by yourself. You'll get there faster. But if you want to go further, you need to go with more people. You need to go with more than just yourself. And that's where Snow and I was able to build the social engineering community, not because of what we knew. We knew a couple things, but we needed amazing volunteers to help us with the logistics. I really wish Pope was here. He brought not just his own expertise, but he brought his network connections that we were able to leverage and bolt on to that if you've been, right, how's the AV? It, it's all, just flat out, it's awesome, right? That's not me. 
That's Pope saying, hey, JC, I need 10 grand. Here, Pope, here's 10 grand. And then he did Lord knows what with it, but it just works. And that's where that trust and that value is. And this is what Bryce talked about. You have to have that networking. You have to have those connections, jobs, sharpening, right? Getting better skills. That's where this type of event comes in. This is how I got to, I'm going to skip over this slide because I just talked about it. This is how I got to this position, right? I assembled a team. I do very little. Well, that's not really true, but I, I don't do nearly the lion's share that I thought I would have to do. I was able to spread load it. And it has been the most rewarding experience because I let people shine where they can shine. And that's the trick. Now, how did I get here? Right here, here. <laughs> Magic. This started because of Ian the intern. Back at that defense company, Ian, who is right next to Dan Kaminsky, this is at a, uh, my first after party at an information security community, uh, information security conference, TorCon in San Diego. Uh, I didn't know anything about it. I knew security. I was doing forensics back when we called APT1 China. But I didn't know anything about DEF CON. I didn't know anything about the, I didn't know anything about this community, right? I, I didn't get it. He introduced me to it. He took me to my first small conference, conference like this. He introduced me to other people. He introduced me to people like Dan. Yeah, amazing, brilliant people, rest his soul. But I wouldn't be anywhere if I didn't trust an intern who I thought I was mentoring. I thought I was helping him. And he helped me in the biggest way possible by introducing me to a community. And I've been able to grow and give back. And for that reason, and for the reason I asked you all to move up closer, I'm going to give you the same gift he gave me. I'm going to ask you now, if you'll please get up, I ask you if you, by yourself, introduce yourself to the person next to you. I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to come network with you for the remaining amount of time. I want you to introduce, don't pack up, don't go up. Talk to the person next to you. You got an Air Force guy right here. Look at this Air Force guy. Hey, Air Force guy. Yeah, talk to the Air Force guy. Yeah, fun, isn't it? Talk to each other. There we go. I don't like this. this is, here's the one that came up. Introduce, talk, make those connections.